I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. It's already a sound of victories in the air. New music, new sounds, and new sounds bring new things. You know, Elisha, when deliverance came in his time for the king of Israel and the king of Judah, he said, bring me a minstrel that they may play. And when he did, the prophetic word came. And it came today. Already, Robin saw something right as we uh, started transitioning to this set. I want you to tell it now. If you, yeah, well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, come here. Come here with me. I forgot <laughs> you have to come here. You know, when we were, um, the music was playing, and, and it was just in the spirit, and all of a sudden I was just caught up in the, in the, in the spirit, and I saw myself walking out of this restaurant in New Orleans. Yeah. And I don't know if I was hungry or, <laughs> or what, but I saw I was right by Mr. B's, and I was coming out, and all of a sudden this wind mm. blew strong, and the Lord said, I'm going to blow strong with the wind of revival in New Orleans. And he said, I'm hovering over Lake Pontchartrain. Wow. And I knew that there is going to be a major breakthrough of the supernatural Hallelujah. on the good side. Yes. The supernatural of the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. the supernatural. There's going to be miraculous mm -hmm. accounts this year in 2024. Wow. Wow. So you ministers get ready in New Orleans. And you know, when you said that, and when you was talking about that, I started seeing uh, people playing. And that sound came through those horns. Mm. That's why I had to hear those horns today. You know, right before we came on, I said, because we just introduced the tune. Yeah. And then suddenly said, I said, play that in horns. And I, when you were talking about New Orleans, I saw people going down the sidewalk, blowing horns, yeah. playing. You know, that's the sound in New Orleans. And it's, it's a tremendous sound. I mean, it's a tremendous sound. It's, it's made there like no other place on the earth because it carries such spiritual overtones and undertones to it. And I saw them going down the sidewalk, and the Lord, I heard this. The Lord said, speak this to, to the people. You're planning on a revival in New Orleans and going into the streets and ministering. Do it now. This is the time. Start this year, and voodoo will come down. It'll start collapsing. And, and the city of the dead will become the city of the living. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. New Orleans has great spiritual uh, significance, especially in the end time. Yeah. And, and voodoo and all that kind of stuff tries its best to hold it down. It's trying to seize on the power of the believer. Yeah, yeah but that's a word from God you have. That's why I said we need to, you need to give that for New Orleans because they're waiting on a breakthrough. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear today, Lord, that we can learn your word together as a family and walk in this new sound, this new sound of victory, this new thing that you're doing with us now. Hallelujah. All over the world, Lord, in Finland, all around, Lord God, in Hawaii, Lord God, different places, Lord, in, in Paris, in, in Europe, all over England that it's going to defeat the sound of Islam. It's going to uproot and cause a vibration that will cause this, this demonic force that pushes through Islam to crumble and these territorial demons to begin to shake and rattle and fall and all the false gods of, of Islam and, and Buddhism and all of this will begin to crumble now at the feet of the Messiah. Hallelujah. And real life can come and not bondage to the people. Amen. Well, the Lord, it was no accident the Lord had us singing about that, uh, John 3.16. Because uh, John 3.16, he'd begin to deal with me about that uh, this morning, is the very cornerstones of our belief. That's the very cornerstone of our whole belief Every child in Sunday school can quote it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In the mind of God and in the plan of God, nothing has changed. Even though men have changed in the fact that they have lost sight of it. 
Men have lost sight of it. Men of learned religion, of learned religion, lost sight of it first. How? As they begin in our great Bible learned institutions, rethinking and questioning the resurrection. This is what turned Harvard into what it is that was a seminary. This is what turned our great learned places that our founding fathers didn't even believe you could govern unless you knew Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Men of learned religion lost sight of it first as they begin in our great Bible learned institutions to re of rethinking and questioning the resurrection, if it was even true. Now, when you have leaders of the religion and leaders of the belief questioning whether Jesus even rose from the dead, you know you're in trouble. Once this happened, government soon followed and strayed off its path, which was to guard the God-given rights of all men. It has opened mankind up for the greatest deception of all time. Satan watched for this moment and stood ready to pounce. A global agenda is ready to go into its place as a new plan, subverting the plan of God. To oppress a people, and I want you to listen to this, to oppress a people without those people knowing they are being oppressed is the greatest deception of all. For then, a false deliverance can be brought and a new Savior embraced. And yet, physical retaliation, my friends, is not the answer. This is what they wanted and waited on Jesus to do when he was walking the earth, was to bring physical retaliation. He came to bring a new kingdom, but not with swords and spears, but a new kingdom that would deal a fatal blow to sin. This is as it is now. People may say, oh, if Jesus was here, and this is what I wanted to get to today. If Jesus was here, he would deal with it. Oh, but he is here. He is present within his body. His body is here to do in this oppressive time what he did in his oppressive time, to deal with the hearts of men and the heart of man, to turn that heart back to God, to usher in revival, the likes of which the world has never seen. That's what the body is to do now. The body, it's time for the body of Christ to begin to come to another level. And it must begin now, this year, right now in January. It must begin. We must go to another level in the body. We are the representatives of Jesus on the earth. We are his body. That's not just in a, uh, just a figuratively uh, of speech uh, uh, Alone, It is also in the spirit. We were made one with him. Ephesians 5.30 says so. We are, we are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. We are spirit of his spirit. He is the head, but we are the body. And the body has to show that they are a part of the head. So we have to begin to deal with the heart of man just like he did. To turn that heart back to God. To usher in revival. The likes of which the world has never seen. Yet there will be a pushback. Especially from religious crowds. Why? Because, now this is figuratively. Religious crowds are afraid of Rome. They're afraid Rome, if you will will revoke their 501c3s and so forth. Well, heads up, they're trying to take them now. And they do not know, the governments don't know that it's allowing, the church allowing them to sow into the kingdom by giving them such rights they're actually sowing into the kingdom of God, and that's what's keeping governments going. 
God always brings the church into his thinking. He never has a thought that does not include you and I. But how does he think of us? I want us to look at St. John chapter 12. We'll start in verse 27. Now this is when Jesus was getting ready uh, things to complete his mission and so forth. He said, now my soul, in verse 27, is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now I want you to think about all that that he just said. Where are we in this, these passages? When Jesus said, Father, glorify thy name. And the Father spoke and said, I have glorified it. That's Jesus. But then he said, and we'll glorify it again. That's you and I. He glorified his name in Jesus and all that he did. But he said, I'm going to glorify it again. When, prophetically, looking through time, he saw the church. He saw the church. And he said, I'm going to glorify it in them. He's speaking of you and I. Jesus said this, remember, he said, the works I do, you'll do, and greater works than I do, you'll do. So he's going to glorify it again in us. It's time for the church to come to a new level. We have to show the world what he showed the world. They kept thinking he's come to overthrow Rome. He's come to, to cause a, a revolution in the physical, to overthrow government. But he said, nay, he's come to bring the kingdom of God into the earth and deal with the problem, the sin in the heart of man. Of man. And that's where you and I are. We're now his body in the earth in the same time of turmoil. We're there. We are there now. And so we have to, we have to show the world that we are his body, his hands extended. The works he did, we must do. The greater works than these shall we do. Because he said, I go to my Father and, he sent the, and he'll send the Holy Ghost. Well, he went and he came. And now he's in us. And it's come to the place right now where religion by night is coming by to talk to us the way Nicodemus did Jesus. Think about it. He's come by to talk to us. Religion is there at the table saying we are, we are so steeped in, in our regulations and our rules. And, and here we are where they're asking Jesus the question. And he said, you must be born again. He said, how can I be born again? And Jesus started talking to him about deep spiritual matters. He said, how can I be born again? He couldn't understand. Religion couldn't understand anything he was saying. But they did know this. They said, we know you're sent from God because nobody can do what you're doing except God sent you. And so Jesus looked at him. And he said, the matters I'm speaking to you of is like the wind. Do you hear the wind? Do you feel the wind? Do you know where it came from? No. Do you know where it's going? No. He said, that's the way it is in the spirit. And you, your heart must be turned again toward God. And it was the miraculous that made them know only God could have sent him. 
And this is the way it is with the church right now. Only the, uh, doing what he did is going to show the world and show religion. We must show religion first. Who he is. You know the first time when John the Baptist started preaching in St. John 1. The scripture says in the beginning was the, the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Then the scripture goes on to say, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shined into the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And then it says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Then he starts talking about a prophet. And he said, when God gets ready to shine the light into the earth and do battle with darkness, he sends a prophet. He always sends the prophets. Says the prophets are not that light, but they're sent to bear witness of that light. That all men must believe on him. And see, what people don't realize is that the prophets were sent. And the prophets came into this world. And they came into this world so that they could set up the time for the evangelist. That they brought the supernatural and showed religion again. God is visiting us again. In the darkest time of oppression. The darkest time of oppression is when men are being oppressed and they don't know they're being oppressed. They've been so used to being oppressed that they, don't, they can't see beyond it. It's like Israel with Rome. They were in oppression and religion had lost sight of it. That they were the authority. And so Rome had them oppressed. But they didn't even know it. They just thought God was going to set up a military kingdom. He said, it's your sin that's causing it. And so the prophets are sent to tell you the light is in the earth. The light's doing battle with the darkness. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say some things here. Lord, I'm, I'm, help me, Lord. Help me. It's time for us to take our place at the table where Nicodemus sat down with Jesus. Nicodemus sat down with Jesus and he had questions. He had questions. He said there's nobody. He came to Jesus in John 3 verse 2. Well, verse 1 says it was a man sent from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This is the leaders of religion. He said, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, truly, truly, verily, verily, I'm not lying. Amen. So be it, so be it. I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And you cannot enter what you cannot see. You have to see the kingdom. And then the scripture says you can enter the kingdom. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? Jesus answered, verily, verily, again he said it twice. I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth or where it wants to. and You hear the sound of it, but cannot tell whence it comes or whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You can't see it in the flesh. But notice he said you can hear it. You can hear it. He said you hear the sound of it. You hear the sound of it. Well, you can also feel the wind. You can hear it. You can feel it even though you can't see it. Hallelujah. 
Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And religion is sitting around the table answering. You're talking about religion that is already saying in their seminaries, Did the resurrection happen? It's just figuratively. Jesus is not really the only way. Do you know how many religious leaders in the earth today that call themselves Christians that b don't believe he's the real and only way? But now religion has come to the time as soon as prophets show up and say, There's, the light is in the earth. I'm bearing witness of the light. Look at what's happening, telling the future, and it's coming to pass. Even some prophets saying it's going to rain fish, and it rained fish. People say, well, why didn't the prophets see the sickness that was coming to the earth? We did see it. I told about it in 2016, told it again in detail in 2019, and I mean way before things happened. Saying it's happening and prophets bearing witness, the light has come. The light has come to show you your future, to give you an expected end. And now religion who has denied the Christ is sitting down saying, what is this about? We must show them and give them the answers Jesus gave them because we are the body. We are to sit down at the table with Nicodemus and answer these questions. Hallelujah. As Moses, verse 14, he said, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Just like the snake, a bronze snake, the brazen serpent was hanged on the pole, the cross in the wilderness. We have to look up and believe that Jesus became our sin for us, that he became sickness for us, that he became and he identified with that snake so that we wouldn't have to. He who knew no sin was made to be sin with our sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And whoever will look on that cross and believe he bore all of that for you and I can see it and enter the kingdom. But now we are, those of us that are in the kingdom are to now bear witness of the kingdom. We are to be his body in the earth he said, I will have glorified my name in you, and I will glorify it again in them. So now it's time for him, his name to be glorified in us. It's time for his name to be glorified in us. I remember a story of Daddy Seymour at Azusa Street when a man had no leg, and he took the wooden peg off of his leg and the glory was so thick, he'd have to wave it out of the way to see. And when he'd wave the glory out of the way and the mist would clear, would rush right back to the man. God showing his will to heal. He has to be kept away from healing in order to not bring it. Because he'll rush to where the pain is. He rushes to where deliverance is needed. It's only men who will wave it away. But Daddy Seymour saw it, grabbed hold of it, and listened to his words. Father, glorify your name. And he was healed. I believe that was the leg incident. Glorify your name, and it grew back out in front of everybody. The arm grew out of a, a socket. It's when his name is glorified, and we have to, as the church, start to say, Glorify your name. Glorify your name. Jesus healed the leper, laid his hands on the leper that everyone thought, oh my God, he's, he's unclean. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. And yet the leper said, you can make me clean if you will. And Jesus said, I will. One translation said, he said, why, well, sure I will. And put his hands on that mess. And when he did, the man was delivered. He was delivered, God glorifying his name through Jesus. Glorifying his name. And now he's saying, it's time for the prophecy to be fulfilled. I will glorify it again. The church is always in prophecy. 
The church is in the prophetic times. The church is in prophetic moves. The church is in it constantly. They just don't know it. They're spoken of so many times. At Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus, when the gates of hell, when they would go there to open the gates of hell and let Pan come out and cause a pandemic on the earth, Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And the church wasn't even in existence then. He had never died and rose again. He was prophesying of us. And when in Switzerland they opened that tunnel, that Gothard portal, it's actually called a portal. It's really called a portal. And when they opened that portal and recreated the ceremony of opening the gates of hell, the prophecy of the church became glaring to the church. And that was around 2016, the same time I gave that prophecy, a sickness was coming to the earth that would make the earth tremble. And when that was given, is about that time that gate was open and Pan was brought out of hell and a pandemic started. The church didn't even know its time. And the scripture says, if you don't know the time of your visitation, there is a power that will lay thee even with the ground. And when they opened that portal, the church should have been so prophetically astute. We should have been so in tune with the prophecies of where we're talked about that as soon as that portal opened, the church stepped up on the scene and said, no, hell no, you can't come into the earth, hell. We close the gates of hell in the name of Jesus. Instead, the church wasn't ready. They didn't even know what was happening. And Pan was brought out in the spirit. And the pandemic from governments was open to the gates of hell, showing you somebody knows what they're doing. And the prophecy of the church, the church just stood blind. and couldn't see anything. And just shut down. And just shut down. Prophets started speaking because the church was in a dangerous place. They couldn't recognize prophecy. So prophets had to start speaking prophecy, speaking prophecy, talking about these things again and bearing witness of the light that was in the earth to do battle with that darkness. And people couldn't see it. And religious leaders sit down at the table and say, my God, what is going on? We don't even believe in prophets. But nobody can be telling the future with this kind of accuracy unless God is with them. And I'll never forget when Kent Christmas held that gathering on July 4. I forget what year it was. Now, that's how time is. 21. When he, he, he did that gathering, what was it called? Let freedom, Let freedom Ring. Think about the title to that. Freedom was more than just in the natural. Let freedom ring. Let freedom have a voice again. Like when in this nation, when they had such a revival, they rang the liberty bell, rang it, rang it, rang it, rang it until they broke it. They cracked it. They rang it so much. And a prophet went to Nashville, standing there, and, and got the, the, the voice, the sound of the world, the Grand Ole Opry House. That's the sound of the world. It's the musical sound. The, where the frequencies are released that change a world. And the original Grand Ole Opry was a church. Think about how it changed. And a prophet brought it back. But he invited prophets from all over to come. And he invited them to come. And he invited us to come. And he let us release our sound. And I'll never forget that day. If you can find it, watch it. And I'll never forget that day when the Lord said a sound started in Florida and now it's arrived in Tennessee. 
And it was a sound of freedom. And it was a sound in the prophetic. And it was the day that the prophets of Baal were challenged. And the prophets were brought out at the end. And, and, and the Lord just gave us freedom. And somebody wasn't afraid to look around at the 11th hour team and say, do your sound. And for the first time that I know of ever at the Grand Ole Opry house, a prophetic sound went forth and shofars were blown. My God, it, we hijacked the sound and took it back for God and released it across the world. When it did, hell went into a panic. And what was it the day before, Robin, you had saw demonic powers entering in that? Was it the day before? It was midnight that night before, before we did that that day. It was because all hell knew a showdown had come to the place. And if the sound was allowed, you're talking about Nashville where the, the sound of all music was a church to start with. It was built to be a church, the Ryman. It was all a church. Songs like I'll Fly Away. <laughs> or I Saw the Light, I mean. Songs like that that you think was all oh, these were these were heathens that wrote it. Man, these were, I saw the light. I mean, come on. And it was always a battle. That's why musicians fought so hard there. Have you ever noticed that musicians, well-known musicians, that I won't call the names right now, but well-known ones will have a song and they'll release a song up there in Nashville that will be a family, uh, faith-filled song and give them fame. And then after the fame comes, they go back to trash. It's because it was anointed. The anointing that's on it is to release life. And a prophet dared bring it back. It strayed so far to where Athena, they have a temple to Athena built in Centennial Park. A 40-foot gold leaf statue of Athena with a serpent and, and uh, the Nike uh, bird and the, and the shield and, the, and all of this. And you have to pay tribute to go in. You give offerings to go in and look at this 40-foot colossal piece of crap. And one prophet up there decided to be a voice against Jezebel. Suddenly, they called in and, and took back the sound of the Opry. Took it back. Oh, there's a lot of things going on. And they took it back. And then the Lord gave us a voice to make our sound there. And it took over the airwaves. And it challenged Jezebel. And the demons Robin saw come in the night before, around midnight the night before. They came and gathered in. They knew that it was a showdown for control of a portal in 21. But the name of our sound was Let Freedom Ring. And we came out there on the opera stage and began to sound shofars and sound things. And religion tried to stop it that day. There was a lot of religion going on behind the scenes that tried to stop it, not the prophet full of religion. Just things surrounding it trying to hijack the sound, trying to put it into their own format. You put God in a box and by God, he'll come out of it. He don't like being in a box. And he don't like for, for new carts and big boards and wheels and, and, and animal appetites to carry his, uh, his ark either. It's supposed to be above a man's thinking so that he can guide the priest where they go. He's not on your time clock. He's not on your time clock. Eternity, what is the time of eternity? If there was a mountain five miles high, solid granite, and a little hummingbird about this big came and sharpened its beak on the top of it every single day, when he whittled the granite mountain down to nothing in the earth, one day of eternity passed. 
That's God's clock. Now, whether you spend that in heaven or hell is your decision. But that day, a prophet said, we must do battle. And the prophets knew it had come. And I wasn't there for a show. Let me tell you what we did when it came time for us to sound. The Lord told me something. He said, now you want to do good, so don't rehearse. So the music you hear us play was unrehearsed. He said, you want to do good, so don't rehearse. Now you tell me what musician thinks like that. And I looked at Krista right before we walked out on stage. And I said, do you know that beat we use on um, uh, War Cry? She said, yeah. I said, just start us off with that. <laughs> That's it. I mean, that was putting her on the spot. You just started a whole thing off out here on the Opry stage. And Krista said something to this effect. I think she told me, well, okay, here goes. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. And she just started on the drums. And it just started going from there. Going from there. Satan couldn't plan against it. And a sound was disrupting things in the air. Those demons that had come in the night before had started disrupting the things and disrupting the sounds. And nobody was there for a show. Nobody. And then when the sounds had stopped, then the prophets were asked to come out on stage. And I came in around the last and sat down and I listened to them and you could see everyone had a word everyone had a word and Timothy Dixon showed the humility of the prophets he came and knelt down I think it was in the circle that's there from the old Rhineman knelt down on the church and started praying humbly before God. Wisdom and strategies were being taught and told by Dutch Sheets and, and, and Hank Kuhneman and, 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 and Kent Christmas and, and things like that. Things had begun to, the man given, the prophet given to oversee the sound of America. The sound put this all on. And I'm trying to use my words just right. But there was a prophetic insight given that day. And the Lord gave me something to say when, when Gene Bailey looked around. And, and, and think of this. He's, he's like the pastor over Flashpoint. In my opinion, Flashpoint is the place where the word of faith and the prophetic comes together. The sword of the Spirit. It's the only place I know that really does that like that. And he was out there and he said, ladies and gentlemen, the prophets, and, and it wasn't there for a show. It was there for a joining. And he spoke and we spoke and everyone had something to say and something to show. But then there, were, there was one seat empty on the other end. And right toward right as it began to start up, the last one, an evangelist came out and sat down. And it was a prophetic sign. It was a prophetic sign. And there was an intermediate evangelist already out there. And it was a prophetic sign that the prophets had come to bear witness of the light and set up the harvest field for the evangelist to come. It was all prophetically ordered. And when the prophets do what they do, it's going to set up the field for the evangelist to come right in behind and win the billion soul harvest and be the greatest time we've ever seen. And the enemy would wreck that if he can. He would upend that. And it was those demons that came in the night before that came in to upend such things because he didn't know the strategy until it started playing out in front of his eyes. Don't you see prophetic order? But the religious world didn't see it. They're like Nicodemus sitting down at a table. 
with the prophets saying, what do you mean by this? What do you mean prophetic lines? Let me tell you something. It's not evangelists or pastors that sit down and advise kings. It's prophets. And it's the time of kings. It's the time when kings were going rogue. And it's the time they are going rogue. And it's time where false kings are trying to be set up. False balances are in the earth. And tell me who understands those things like the prophets. Because they deal in the future. But it's to set up something. God still has a billion soul revival on his mind. And it's going to take the strength of the evangelist doing that. I'm a prophet. I can do the work of an evangelist. But I'm not an evangelist. But an evangelist can operate in the prophetic but not be a prophet. And if you just stay in your lane and work together. How can the, the, the hand say to the foot, I don't need you? This is ridiculous. And we see it all culminating. And now for this is the time religion. There's a few coming to sit down at the table with prophets and say, what is going on? Religion don't understand such things. You talk about prophetic timelines and they just tilt. And so now the time has come when, when the Lord wants to glorify His name again. In the time we do battle with the gates of hell.